Yeah, I will talk about that later on because um, these are wonderful therapies and wonderful theories, but what we will see is how they can be practically applied to all kinds of groups who really desperately need these kinds of interventions and also how fast they can work. I did a presentation at another conference in October and the simple thesis of the present, and I was very, really blessed, I had some wonderful people in the audience, uh, some great, uh, the great researchers of our time, but my thesis was, let's just run through all of the mechanisms, neurological, epigenetic, hormonal, and so on, and measure the speed at which each of those things work. And it turns out many of these things work in one or two or three seconds to radically reconfigure the way our bodies are. So um, what I'll emphasize today is the epigenetic effects of all of these therapies. Now, um, before you get too deeply into what that is, the old idea, and this is reflected still in the popular media, I, mean, I was distraught reading The Economist a week or two ago, was that they mentioned a gene for uh, alcoholism. I'm thinking, a gene for alcoholism? Oh, no. Because there's a gene for this, a gene for that. Now, some things, obviously, like eye color and height, I'm six foot five and a half, these things are strongly inherited. Okay? My great grandfather was six foot six. Uh, I have gray eyes. Now, th all those sorts of things, those are strongly inherited traits, but that only applies to maybe 20% of the genome. The other 80% of the genome is things that are engaged in conjunction with signals from the environment. And we'll get, get more deeply into what the environment is and how it works. The old view has been that a gene for this, a gene for that, but it's much more complex than that. And here's a story in the New York, from the New York Times two years ago that just slaps you right between the eyes and says, hey, wake up to the effects of epigenetics. The woman on the side there with the orange shirt, her name is Josephine Tesoro. And the New York Times does not mention the name of her sister, but Josephine and her sister are 92-year-old identical twins. Now, they have exactly the same genome because, of course, the zygote splits into two cells, and you find two people growing up with identical genes. Not similar genes, but the exact same genome. And what the Times story points out, and it's in your notes in full, is that at 92, their health outcomes and life expectancy is radically different. Josephine Tesoro, the healthy sister, is, gets around fine by herself, drives a car, is a member of a bridge club, volunteers at a hospital gift shop, and is in generally good health. Her sister, on the other hand, has all kinds of chronic problems. And has lost all of her, her cognitive faculties to senile dementia. So here are two people with the same genome. I'll say it again. Two people with the same <coughs> genome have very different health and life outcomes. How can this possibly be if an old idea of a gene for this and a gene for that is correct? The answer is epigenetics. James Vorpal, director of the Longevity Lab at the Max Planck Institute, Max Planck was the guy who said, science advances one funeral at a time. As old ideas die off, it takes, oh, people die, and well, people kind of say, okay, this isn't really true. Um, identical twins die on average more than 10 years apart. Another study found that the genome of identical twins cannot be distinguished apart when they're three years old. But at age 50, they diverged significantly. So the Human Genome Project and cataloging these genes is a very interesting exercise. But it's like having uh, a diagram of all of the members of an orchestra and when it's going to stay playing. You have the parts list. It's very interesting to know what the parts of a car are. How do they fit together, though? How do they work together? If you pull this out, what will happen? The Genome Project doesn't tell us that. It's just the parts list and how these things function is critical. It's this critical. The, the, uh, these two mites have the same genome. Again, identical genome, not similar, identical genome. This mouse over here with the yellow coat 
there is a gene that is expressed in this mouse called the agouti gene. And that gene is suppressed on the mouse at the right, the brown mouse. Also, these agouti mice are much bigger. They have obesity. They have much higher rates of cancer. And they have half the life expectancy because one gene is suppressed epigenetically. That is how important the effect of epigenetics on both animals and humans can be. Very, very important. Let's jump because the theme of today's, uh, today's workshop is energy medicine. How does epigenetics tie into energy medicine? The links are numerous and they are fascinating. And I want to also emphasize that I, I try and be outrageous in my talks, and I hope I succeed in outraging you in some way, shape, or form today. If I don't, please you know, mark a bad thing on my uh, speaker's evaluation form. He, he failed to outrage me. But I wanted to emphasize that my books are exhaustively endnoted. I have over 200 studies which I reference in my book, Soul Medicine, which is all about energy medicine. And at last count, there were 417 studies referenced in the genie in your genes. The soft cover of this book comes out in about two weeks. And this is, again, an exhaustively referenced book. So all of the things I say today are grounded not in fringe science, but in studies published in reputable peer-reviewed journals. It's just that some study has one little piece of the puzzle, and another one has another piece of the puzzle. So I'd go to energy psychology conferences and hear all this excitement about these methods. And I'd, I'd hear biologists like Jim talking about the connective tissue body and its ability to propagate these signals. But then I wanted to put it all together in one package. When you connect the dots, the picture you get are the ability of human beings to heal and of energy to help them heal very, very rapidly is quite remarkable. This image over here is is taken from a very advanced MRI, a helicular MRI, at the University of Nottingham in England. And it is just, I like it because it's just beautiful. This image of the human energy field from this, this a very advanced uh, uh, group at the University of Nottingham that build these, these instruments. And um, every one of us has an energy body. So, you know, I, I might look and see this person has white hair, this person has brown hair, this person's male, this person's female. But if you could see each other in the, these spectra, we'd all look like this. You're gorgeous. <laughs> You're beautiful in this spectrum and in many others. Not only does each of us have this energy body, but those bodies interact. This is the electrical field of your heart. The heart seal extends about 15 feet away from the, the center. It's shaped like a donut, that torus shape you see there in the illustration. And Willem Eithoven, in 1924, discovered the heart's electrical field, that, that this, this organ had an electrical field of its own, and won the Nobel Prize in Medicine or Physiology for that discovery. And what happens is that when we interact with each other, it's not just our physical bodies that are interacting, it is our energy fields as well. Now, long before the University of Nottingham invented their helicular MRI, or Willem Eindhoven won the Nobel Prize for discovering the heart's field, human beings knew about these fields and knew about these fields for the purpose of healing centuries ago, millennia ago. And one of the, the uh, beautiful drawings from ancient China over 2,000 years ago is of acupuncture points. There are many of these illustrations of acupuncture points, these energy flows, mapping these energy flows in the body uh, for health. One of the things I do is I lecture to a lot of physicians and psychologists and psychiatrists, and chiropractors and other medical professionals. and um, Often I have skeptics in the audience, so I have a little portable skin galvanometer with me. And I'll actually find their acupuncture points. I'll get a skeptic out of the audience, I don't have time for today, but I have one in my bag, and it will, will bring someone out of the audience who doesn't believe.